Everyone, thank you for being here. Uh, we uh, appreciate uh, the effort uh, for you to get here today. Um, we welcome you. Um, at this time, we're going to go ahead and have Superintendent Douglas speak for about 10 minutes. Uh, she will take questions at that time. 
And uh, at that point, if you have any need for a one-on-one -on -one interview, please uh, come find me and we will set that up for you. Uh, and at this time, without further ado, I would like to introduce Arizona Superintendent of Public Instruction, Diane Douglas. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, what I would like to do, as I like to start all meetings I participate in, is I would ask if children, can you please put down the, um, the sign for just a moment, and please everyone join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First, I'd like to say that I'm honored to be here today representing the people of Arizona as Arizona's Superintendent of Public Instruction. It's humbling to shoulder such a responsibility and to be tasked by my fellow citizens with the most important function that we have as a state, and that is the education of our children. Second, let me welcome all the esteemed guests, staff, and especially the children who are here today. I'm honored by your presence and I thank you so much for being here and helping us hold our wonderful sign. In my experience, and um, my family actually yesterday celebrated our 25th anniversary in Arizona, um, I've never seen a superintendent of public instruction come out with a comprehensive solution to cure our education ills. I deeply respect many of my colleagues who have worked to improve education and provide additional funding to our schools. Unfortunately, we focus on the here and now and rarely plan for the future. Our edu education policy too often is set in whatever funding is left behind and by the latest fad in pedagogy. Today, I'm introducing my own approach. I can't reasonably carry out the will of the voters by simply focusing on the next few months or going along with the crowd. I serve the voters of Arizona and I intend to do what is needed. First and always, speak the truth. Next, present a plan that is a comprehensive solution to Arizona's lagging educational system. I did not come up with this plan in isolation. I have my own strong ideas that I campaigned on and was elected upon, but in addition, I've traveled the state. I have conducted over a dozen public meetings. I've, I've taken comments from literally thousands of people on education, and I have met with school leaders, toured campuses, and talked with a wide range of advocates for education. Just as important, I have relied on advice from a truly admirable, caring, and outstanding staff at the Education Department of Education, Arizona Education Department of Education, and I thank so many of you for being willing to be here today. It's wonderful. Um, and I, I've always been a small government conservative, and one of the greatest delights I had in taking office was to find such a hardworking, dedicated, and caring staff of people in whom we have trusted the education of Arizona's children. Each year, I plan to repeat the process that we've done so far. Listen, listen to the people of Arizona, bring comments back to expert staff, and develop and constantly improve a comprehensive plan to make Arizona's education system, God bless you, the best in the world. Our system did not deteriorate from neglect overnight, and simply coming up with a plan will not fix it tomorrow. We will need to band together, think strategically, work as a team to put Arizona's children first, because AZ kids can't afford to wait. The entire presentation is 
quite long, and so it has been loaded on flash drives for, on bracelets that we will be handing out to each one of you. The presentation will also be posted online, and we can make hard copies available where necessary. There are just too many proposals included for me to stand here and recite them all to you. I'm sure you all have attention spans of six hours or more, but I also know that you all don't want to sit here and listen to me speak for six hours or more. So for today, I will focus on a few of the very large proposals. First, I have to reiterate that while funding is not a panacea for our educational woes, it has become critical for our teachers and our classrooms. As I recommended a few weeks ago, I stand by the need for an immediate $400 million per year guaranteed in, in per perpetuity for our teachers in the classrooms. The money can be used for salaries, for reducing class size, or a combination of both. I leave that to the locally elected school boards. They're in the best position to decide the needs of your districts. Our teachers have officially reached the lowest paid in the nation according to a very recent survey. And Arizona is ranked third from the bottom in places for teachers to work. And yet, as Winston Churchill once said, Never have so many owed so much to so few. We have a teacher shortage. We have extended the time that we allow our substitutes to continue to teach. We are trying to recruit teachers from China and the Philippines, and we have a turnover rate around 45% in the first two years for new teachers. Teachers and parents making a personal impact on an individual student is how children <coughs> learn. Bless you, whomever that was. It is not the latest fads in standards, curriculum, or technology. Although those three have their place, I'm not so sure about fads. We need to make sure what we put before our children works. But they are worthless without talented teachers, well-informed, and actively involved parents. The second major issue, issue for me is to make Arizona a state known for culturally inclusive programs. Every school in Arizona should teach rich curriculum that celebrates the diversity of our population and the struggles and successes that all, of, all the citizens have shared. For too long, our curriculum has lagged, teaching racism by teaching children based on the color of their skin. We should have the same culturally rich, inclusive instruction in Window Rock, Scottsdale, Yuma, and Tucson. Racism is hard to combat, but academic segregation and the teaching of hate through critical race pedagogy must stop now. Our schools need to be models of acceptance and respect, not a breeding ground for resentment and division. Another effort to impact neglected regions of our state is the creation of educational developmental zones, or EDZ, E-D-Z. What's education if we don't have yet a new acronym? There are four areas in the state, and they're highlighted in the document that you'll receive that have a larger square mile area than 13 of our states. In these four areas, parents and students do not have enough quality choices for their schools and their children's education. We forgive doctors student debt to work in underserved areas, and we create economic development zones where we give businesses tax breaks. I propose we need to do the same for underserved education areas. In these regions, we could forgive student, teacher student loans and allow staff and schools significant tax incentives. The alternative is to see one generation after another living in these areas abandoned to poor education, poverty, crime, and welfare, not because they deserve it or not because they can't learn 
but because of the area they just happen to live in. And that is and should be intolerable to us. Finally, the last item I want to speak on this evening before giving you a chance to all look through the proposals is standards. Anyone who followed my campaign knows one thing for sure about me. I oppose the Common Core standards. I challenge the State Board of Education to vote at their very next meeting to reverse their previous actions and sever the ties between Arizona and the Common Core standards. Make no mistake, this vote will not change a single standard immediately, but it will make clear that we in Arizona are smart enough and engaged enough to develop standards that are our own and are uniquely designed for our specific state needs and our population challenges. Next, ADE will be recommending a significant increase in standards. These include explicit phonics instruction, additional requirements for reading in K-3, higher math standards, expansion of civics and economic instruction, and world language graduation requirements for those students who have shown proficiency in English. Nearly every country in the world teaches its children to speak more than one language. Americans are unprepared for current and future economy if they are not multilingual. Once a child in Arizona is proficient in English, we should teach them at least one additional language. We should also seek to preserve our Native American languages, not just for members of our tribes and nations, but for any Arizonans who may wish to learn. Lastly, our math and foreign language standards currently are inadequate for many college admission standards. Our teaching of civics and economics is nearly non-existent. Too many of our students don't know our rich history as a state or a nation, nor do they understand our government or our economy. We need a revival in Arizona developed standards not one-size-fits-all, hand-me-down standards which have already been abandoned by many of the states who, like Arizona, blindly adopted them. I ask each of you to read the proposals I have included in the Arizona Kids Can't Afford to Wait package. If you disagree, I ask that you join the discourse, not put me down, but hold up Arizona's children. This is a plan that involves gaining the support of others across many areas of education and government. It includes short, medium, and long-term goals. My sincere hope is that all these proposals are enacted, but failing that, I hope that we at least stop looking at Arizona education on a month-to-month -month and just a um, appropriation to appropriation in cycle. Instead, we must determine what's best for the education system. We must determine what the best education system in the nation looks like, and that's what we must aspire to for our children. I want to thank the staff that was here today, the students. I want to thank everyone who's worked with me so hard to help put this proposal together. Our children are our future, and they can't afford to wait. God bless our children and our education system, and may God continue to bless the great state of Arizona and the great nation of America. I thank you all for being here today. Right, kids? AZ kids can't afford to wait. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Have not looked at the our, um, 
Common Core Standards, which is English Language Arts and our math standards. They've not been reviewed since they were dropped in place in 2010. So the point is to make sure that they are truly the standards that Arizona students need to be successful. The governor asked the Board of Education to review the Common Core Standards that started in the summer of the summer. Would your time be better used engaging in that process, meeting with the board, being on those panels, reviewing Common Core rather than just saying let's blow it up? I've never said blow it up. And I have been very engaged in that committee that's reviewing the standards. The Arizona Department of Education has had a standards review process that has been in place for a very long time, very successfully in place for a very long time. And we just brought forward um, world languages and PE and the art standard. But yet for some reason, the common core standards have been set offside and, and out. And I, I know from the amazing staff I have at the Department of Education, if we had just used our process, we would probably be well down the way to having the changes we need to the standards to make them as rigorous as Arizona's children need. Thank you. I have one more. Um, most of the things that you've laid out in this 157-page plan are the purview of the legislature and the Board of Education. What can you do and what will you do to actually get these changes adopted? I can absolutely use the position of superintendent of public instruction to bring these dialogues forward and make sure that they move forward as best they can. Several of the items that are in the proposal are already uh, things that the department will be working to bring legislation forward um, this next session. And we can certainly um, make sure that this is in the forefront of people's mind. I've never claimed that I had the authority to wave a magic wand and make Common Core go away or make any changes. It's all about making sure that people ensure Arizona's children are first and foremost. And as long as we do that, we, I know we can meet the challenges that we have. Larry Core and his Vision 2025 just received a report, oh, you know, probably about eight hours ago, saying we lack sufficient college grads to meet the high-tech needs. You put out a report saying we've got more than enough college grads and we ought to be talking more technical education. It seems like the, the, the folks who are on his committee who are involved with trying to fill the job say we don't have enough college grads. Why would you tell people, well, don't worry about college? I'm not telling people don't worry about college. I'm telling people that we have to have all the options and opportunities available for our children to meet their needs, their goals, and their desires for their education. One of the most phenomenal things about the American education system that is different than, I would say, almost any other country in the world is that our system does not decide for any particular child or their family what course their future must take. That's something that's open to every single American child and we deserve, they deserve that we offer them a wide range and breadth of opportunities so that they can grow up to be what they choose to be. Ms. Douglas, can you speak to the lawsuit filed by the Board of Education yesterday and how that might affect this plan? Um, no, I can't. Quite frankly, I have not read the suit yet. Well, okay, but then let, let's talk about, again, you haven't read the suit. You'd have to be deaf, dumb, and blind not to know there's a little bit of friction out there. You have many of the changes you want involve the participation of and approval of the Board of Education. You seem to be at odds, at war with them. So how, given this friction, how given the fact that you sued them, now they've sued you, are you going to get the Board of Education say, of course, Diane, we'd love to do what you want? This is a very comprehensive proposal that meets the needs of Arizona students and Arizona families, and I am absolutely confident. I know I am always ready, willing, and able to work with people on the issues of education in Arizona and the best interests, and I am absolutely confident as long as everybody else keeps that first and foremost in their minds, we'll put our political differences aside. Well, let's ask, let me ask the other half of the question. You have a funding proposal in there 
that matches neither what the governor wants, the fact is he took a few swats at him, nor what the legislature wants, my word, not yours. Yes, please. Uh, so again, having decided you've got a plan which doesn't match what either the Republican leadership wants or the governor wants, how do you expect the legislature to want to enact what you what you suddenly say, well, of course, Diane, that, you know, how we, we're, we need to be talking to people and coming to the table. And I think our plan is realistic. I think it is, um, it is very doable. We know that revenues have exceeded expectations, carryovers from last year. Um, I also know that there will be needs to be met. And I can't think of a better need with these revenues than the children of Arizona. Given your endeavor and the admonition to have the board rethink their stand on common core, do you still plan to um, be at future meetings or would you plan to just pass them up? When, when the State Board of Education puts this proposal on the agenda to discuss the removal of common core from Arizona, I will be there to vote yes. And until then, you're going to be AWOL? I will look at the agendas, and I will schedule my time accordingly. When they're working on the best interests of the children of Arizona, we will be there. But the board says they can't work for the best interests of the children of Arizona because you're not there. They, uh, I can't speak for what the board has said. I'm not going to comment on, a, on something they've said that I haven't even heard. The... Um, I'm at plenty of meetings, and when the work puts forward the best interest of the children of Arizona, I will be there. Let me ask you about testing. Are you, are you saying that what they're doing right now is not in the best interest of the children? I will judge each, indiv each agenda individually. But you know what, sir? Right now, I'm here to talk about a proposal that will truly bring forward the best interest of the children of education, and that's where I prefer to see our focus for tonight. Let's talk about standardized testing. We've got a proposal in there that the legislature actually defeated last year, but with parents say, I don't want to send my kids into standardized testing. What's I don't know how to say this without sounding uh, you know, in your face, but what's the paranoia about having kids tested when in fact it helps determine if schools are doing what they're supposed to do? The point of testing is to ensure that a child has learned what a child needs to learn and to make sure that we put measurements in place that we can take corrective action for that child in a timely process. It took six weeks, eight weeks to take the AZ merit test. We won't see the results of those tests until October or November. That's not timely testing. I believe we have forgotten why we originally started testing our children. But we're testing so we can compare, leaving aside Common Core being able to compare to other states, it tells you, <coughs> I've been covering the Department of Ed for 30 some years now, and we've been doing different things. How are some schools doing better than others? Who can improve? A to F, performing, underperforming, all the labels we've used. Without the testing, how do you determine which schools are performing, which aren't? First of all, we're only talking about um, protecting the rights of probably a small um, number of parents who would like to have that option to opt out. So I don't think by any stretch of the imagination it's going to skew the results of um, the testing. But we've been testing children since I was in school, elementary school, and Howie, that was longer than 37 years ago. And we still managed to determine how we were doing compared to other children in other classes, other children in other schools, other children in other states without, um, without endless testing. I think they need to be devised, devised with the help of Arizona parents and with um, certainly our experts at the Department of Education and certainly with teachers all across Arizona. The $400 million in the perpetuity that you're proposing, is that a figure that you are confident that over time can be met? 
that the legislature can fund for the upper state. Yes, I believe it can because if you've looked at the proposal that we have in place, it's not um, it's 400 million that we know can be funded by the. Um, by the overage in revenues that we've had that have exceeded expectations. But we also want to bring into this the land trust. I intend to work with the congressional delegation to make sure that our land trust generates the type of money that it should be. Um, one of the problems with payment in lieu of taxes is that we really don't get the revenues we should. If we can get back our federal lands, not only um, should the, should more public lands be sold, but it has a two-part piece to it. Number one, you sell the land, the money goes into the trust, and it needs to be in there protected as the principle of the trust. But then that land can also go on the property tax rolls, and that's a huge portion of our local funding system for our schools. So yes, I think between working the land trust and the revenues that have exceeded expectations, yes, I do believe we can make this an ongoing a uh, funding system that our teachers can count on and that our parents can count on for their children. I, I yeah. gotta ask one more thing. Uh, the children that were here, I gather that they were the children of your employees. We got t-shirts and I recognize, you know, maybe six, seven dollars a t-shirt ain't much. If we're looking for every nickel, why is the Department of Education paying for t-shirts with, with your logo on it? Howie, the most important thing I believe any elected official does is communicate with the, the voters, the parents, the citizens they serve. And we do have a moderate budget at uh, the Department of Education that we watch very carefully. I'm a fiscal conservative. I always have been. I believe I always will be. But the most important thing an elected official can do, in my opinion, is communicate with the people that they serve. Part of that is bringing them to the table. Part of it was going out on the road to talk to them. That cost a little bit of money, but that's the most important thing I can do is make sure I'm representing the people who have elected me by actually hearing their voice and incorporating that here. I understand hearing the voice. A little, little backdrop for the TV cameras at, at the cost of, what was it, $400? Seriously? Seriously, Howie. Seriously. Quest, one more question about I the thought, 400 we million. Gonna We're going to have a chance for one-on-one. -on -one. So okay. I, I just have one more question. I think everybody else is interested in. You talked about on the 400 million. Um, you talked about getting some federal land into the land trust and being able to bring in property taxes on that. If that doesn't happen, would your plan still be financially sustainable? We, we, Go to the microphone, oh, please. Sorry. <laughs> no, I'm afraid to. Howie might ask me another question. <laughs> Uh oh, somebody. Um, we believe it still will be. If, if we believe it is sustainable with the, the land that is in the trust selling more of the land now. Um, if, we, if, we need, if we are not able to get the federal government to, to give us the land, and that would take a lot of work with the congressional delegation, whom I speak with on a regular basis, um, but we believe within the land trust itself currently, we can sustain that program. Thank you. Thank you. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna be uh, doing one on ones. Thank Anyone has questions, please come find me. Thank you. All right, there we go. And that was the Diane Douglas press conference. We appreciate everybody watching this News Now stream. What a day it has been with this deadly, deadly shooting. Uh, Kinsey will be back at 6.30 
with full coverage because there is going to be another press conference. We just had a press conference that wrapped up. We will be playing that for you at 6.30 in its entirety. And let me tell you, there is new numbers out. It is now being called 10 confirmed people dead at the school. Not 13 that was originally being reported. It is now 10. So we will have much more on that coming up at 6.30. Kinsey will be there for you. Have a great night, everybody. We'll see you in a little bit.